Hello. Um, it's good to be back. It's my second time at Search Leads, which means that I can't have been that crap last time because they asked me to come back again. So that's all good. Last time I thought I might have bored people to sleep with my take on why international PPC was similar to American football. It, it, you have to be there, I guess. Um, what I want to do today is talk about um, the RFP process. So um, if you don't know what an RFP is, it's a request for proposal. But it's, I should have done a bit better in sexing the title up, but it's more about how to hire a great agency. And then if you are a good agency, how, how do you win? Um, so I want to cover that a little bit. Um, before I do, who the hell am I? Um, so I'm Matt Holmes, and I'm the uh, group head of digital marketing for Thomas Cook Airline. So that is uh, Thomas Cook Airline UK and also Condor Germany. So we fly about 19 million people a year to various short, medium and long haul destinations. Um, if you ever flown with Thomas Cook, you might just think that we fly to Mallorca or to um, or to the beach holiday. Um, we also do long haul, so we fly to New York, fly to Vegas, LA. We're actually the only direct flight from Manchester to San Francisco and to Seattle. Um, that's my plug done, so the boss is going to be going to be happy that I've given that. Um, check us out, TC Airlines UK on Twitter. We are going to do some cool um, social media campaign. Uh, it's going to launch on Monday, so. Um, Stay tuned for that. So I've done that plug bit. That's out of the way. I'm not trying to sell you anything. So this is the uh, that's the only plug I'll do. So how do I know about this whole process? So um, I'm a client side marketer, um, but I started out agency side. And when you are in an agency, as I'm sure many of you are, there's sometimes that expectation that you're involved in that pitch process. Uh, they put you onto a pitch team. Um, you know, you have to go out and win that, that new business. Um, the, the agency that I work for is really lucky to actually have, we did some specialist coaching with the brilliantly named The Pitch Doctor. Check him out, word up, word up Peter Rush. Um, so I've been involved in some really cool um, pitch situations, some really shit pitch situations. Um, the most interesting one was actually um, pitching to Qatar Airways and they actually wanted to, their RFP response to go back to them in an envelope with a wax seal on it. I was like, wow, this is, this is great, this is medieval. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so that was, that was a load of fun. Um, but all, what I'm going to present to you today is actually based on, on real experience. So um, last year when I was working at a, a different organisation, which was a, um, a B2B e-commerce site, we found ourselves in a bit of a mess agency-wise. Um, we'd gone through a couple of agencies in quite a short period of time. I was quite new to the business. Uh, the agency that we had, their, their fee wasn't enough for them to do a good job. And we wanted to make sure that we... Um, you know, we, want, we want, needed to make a change. Um, so those of you who I've worked with before and my team at the moment will know that I, I'm not very good at structure. I like to freestyle things, but in this case, what we felt that we needed to do was a proper RFP process, so that kind of written document, just to make sure that we were covering all the right spots. So something that we did, um, we did last year. Um, and out of that, there came to be these eight really interesting things, which kind of led to us having quite a good process. Um, we got good feedback from the agencies that were involved. We were happy with the outcome. It went quite smoothly for us. It didn't take too much of our time. Um, and even the agencies that didn't win seemed to go away happy, um, which I thought was a good result. Um, and during the course of researching how to do an RFP process, because it was the first one I'd done, as I say, I like to, to, to wing it a lot of the time, um, I couldn't really find anything that was helpful or to explain to me um, what we should be doing. So we kind of made it up as we went along and I wanted to present to you the, the things that we found that were really important and were effective. So helping us to find a good partner but also having that structure that made everyone go away happy. So number one, um, I'm going to switch between kind of stock photos, memes and probably irrelevant gifts so stick with me. Um, so step number one, um, tell the agencies who you are. Now, I'm going to throw up a disclaimer because this might sound really obvious. But if this is your pitch process, it's your document as the client, you need to tell the agencies who you are. Um, and I'm not talking about things that they can find on Wikipedia. I'm talking about really delving into the information that is going to help somebody make a better decision about you. Um, so that includes things like your team. What is your team like? What's the personality of your squad? Um, that's going to make a difference when it comes to, um, when it comes to the, the potential partners and finding out what you need. You want to get agencies excited about working with you, maybe not quite this excited, um, but especially if you are a lesser known brand or if you are a smaller company, you might, it might allow you to punch above your weight a little bit if you can kind of give, find the right information which is going to get an agency to be excited about, about working with you. Um, 
a lot of agencies are quite selective about who they might want to pitch to. Um, it takes a lot of time. It costs an agency money to, to go through a pitch process. So you want to make sure that you are um, selling the benefits of why an agency should work with you um, above all else. So the sec second thing is chemistry. So um, a lot of the times when I've either been uh, kind of client side or agency side, kind of going out and seeing these, some of the, especially agency side, some of the RFP requests that we used to come through, they were very kind of methodical and we need this and we need that. Um, you know, if you've ever thought about a kind of a, if you saw a job advert and it was just the kind of the, these are the details of the job that we want you to do, it didn't tell you who the company was, it didn't tell you what the company did, um, would you apply for that job? I, I don't think I would. Um, so we need to move away from it just being that kind of transactional bit of information and try to bring some emotion into it. Um, you know, people make connections with each other um, and that should come across in that, um, that RFP um, document and throughout your, your whole process of trying to, uh, of trying to work with an agency. Um, and a really good way to, to, um, to test for this is um, something that I learned from a really great podcast, which is by um, Bruce Daisley. If anyone knows Bruce Daisley's podcast, which is Eat, Sleep, Work, Repeat. Um, if you don't know it, check it out. It's really good about, um, about uh, happiness at work. Um, so they had the, founder of, um, he had the founder of Innocent Drinks on there. And when they're doing the hiring process, they talk about something called the van test. And what that is essentially is, could you spend three hours in a van with this person? Um, if you couldn't, they're not getting hired. Um, for me, it was the same with, with, with our agencies. If I felt that I couldn't sit in a van with these agencies for three hours and have not really awkward conversation, uh, it probably wasn't going to work out for a, a, for a kind of client agency relationship. What's quite cool is that my, my new boss has now co-opted this and added an airline spin to it. Um, so I heard him in a meeting the other day saying, oh, I couldn't fly to Florida with him. I could maybe get as far as Mallorca. So I, li I like that that's, uh, that's become a thing now. Now, this is the, uh, this is the awkward part, the, the awkward conversation. Um, if you're already working with an agency, do you invite them to pitch again if you're going out to pitch? Uh, if, the, if the trust is there, if the chemistry is there, maybe if, if it's just the case that their fee is limiting them, as was, was our case when we did this last year, yeah, invite them, invite them to pitch. Um, if not, if you, if you think it's just going to dead end and you just don't you want to avoid that awkward conversation of telling them they're not invited, you know, as I said before, agencies spend a lot of time and effort uh, in pitching. If you're going to invite your incumbent agency, knowing full well that they've got, not got a shot at the end of it, that's going to waste their time, your time, and it's just not a really cool thing to do. Um, so I would say don't do it unless you think that there's going to be a chance. Um, so number three, so we should be really clear on what success looks like. Um, you know, you want to make sure that in your document, throughout your process, that you make sure you set out kind of your strategy, your goals, and your KPIs. Really find something that is, that is measurable. Um, you want to be able to measure success. Um, as a golden rule, if you can't uh, define what success looks like from your age, for your agency, you shouldn't be working with them. You need to go away and, and understand what, um, what the measures of success are. Because if you don't know what success looks like, how is any agency that you bring on board going to be able to do a good job? Um, but it's just not going to work out. Um, so I think that's something that's important. And don't be afraid to talk about spend, especially if it's a, a PPC um, agreement. If, you, uh, if you're not setting out what the spend is over the course of the contract, how would a prospective agency know whether this pitch is going to be worth their time or not? Um, a lot of agencies will operate a, a bid, no bid policy. So they will look at all the information and decide, is this worth us pitching? Do we have a chance of winning financially? Does it make sense? Are we going to make any money from it? Um, so you need to be upfront with these types of, um, this types of information as well. And, and Laura touched on it as well with, with, with the, the competition. You should, in, as part of this RFP document, you should really be t t telling your agencies who your competitors are, and obviously not, not Amazon, we know this. Um, and you know, what, what's your seasonality, all these types of information which could lead to better decision making uh, and better planning for the, um, for the agency, and so they can know, understand a little bit more about your business as well. Um, and then beware, beware of scope creep. 
So if you work in an agency, you might have come across scope creep. It's where you've got kind of quite a loose brief from, from a client um, and then they end up getting you to do more and more work, which you're not getting paid for, but they seem to think is part of their contract. Um, so what I would clearly do as part of work, trying to work with a new agency is really clearly define what the, what the scope of work is. Um, what exactly do you need them to do? Try and spell it out a little bit so that there's no confusion about what they're pitching for um, and what they're going to be expected to do as part of that contract. Again, it, this is one of those things that sounds obvious, but you'd be really surprised how vague a lot of briefs to clients, uh, sorry, to agencies can be. Okay, so we've kind of looked at chemistry, we've looked at how to be able to measure success. But then how within an RFP document or within an RFP process do you actually get to that information? Um, so I want to kind of cover that a little bit now. So I want to talk about, um, everybody's heard of open questions. So it's one of those things that, that we learn. Um, but sometimes open questions just aren't good enough. There needs to be a little bit more structure to, um, to that question to help you get the answer you want to. Especially with um, agencies sometimes, forgive me anybody that's in an agency here, will sometimes have canned responses to to questions that they've seen before. If you're asking the same questions as everybody else, you're probably going to get a recycled answer. Um, so try to put a bit more thought and a bit more structure into those questions. So I'll give you an example of that. And um, I do love a Drake meme. Um, so rather than asking, what is your approach to onboarding and project management? If you ask that kind of question, you're probably going to get an answer that has been, that uh, the agency has uh, given to a lot of different clients. Um, again, this is a real example. Um, this is something that we, um, that we asked our agency. So rather than asking, we try, wanted to understand about onboarding and project management, but we said, what would the first 90 days of working with you look like? How do you prioritize? What's your approach to managing large projects? How do you make sure that the BAU activity continues during big ticket projects? Describe your ways of working and how teams collaborate for the benefit of the client. So there's a few points in there that we are expecting an answer to, which will help us get to a more complete answer. Um, and it, again, it just makes for a little bit more of a meaty answer that you can actually make a decision uh, based on. Otherwise, you may get answers from a, a few different agencies that actually just look the same. And you can't differentiate. OK, so. Uh, Number five, so transparency on your decision criteria and scoring. Um, we want people that are responding to your RFP to focus on the right things. We want them to know what's important to you so then they can give you the answers that you need rather than spending 90 pages of waffling about themselves um, when you actually want them to focus on specific things. Um, and that is a real example of something that, that has happened to me. A 90 page RFP response, straight in the bin. Um, so I'll give you an example of that. So what we did is to, we tried to structure it in, in this kind of way. So we had five or six categories which were um, important to us. And again, these are real examples. This is what was on our, our RFP that we did last year, it was something that, uh, for, for the um, e-commerce company that I was working for. So we want to have a um, you waiting, adding up to 100%, so you can actually focus on the things that are more important to you. And then try and give, make sure that you've got these kind of clear descriptions of what that entails so that there's no misinterpretation. So when we're talking about language capabilities, we wanted to see the process and of how um, keyword management and, and ad copy would work. Um, just to, again, make sure that there's, no, um, no, no, there's not too much room for um, misinterpretation of the, of the question. Um, so we kind of went through it like that. So we added it up to, uh, added it up to 100%. And then within that, um, the scoring, we had um, points uh, one, two, three, four, or five. Five was fully meeting that criteria, so everything that we'd set out here was completely met, and they were able to uh, explain what, um, how they met that criteria. And then one was they didn't either didn't answer it or didn't really um, cover it in the way that we wanted to. Um, so that does get a little bit mathsy, um, but I'll come to that in a second. Um, so when we were scoring it, what we did was try and avoid groupthink, so everyone just kind of wanting to agree with me or agree with each other. We had people score it independently. So we kind of debated how, um, how an agency had done on a particular uh, topic. Um, we scored them out of five. Um, if the scores were wildly different, if somebody gave a two, somebody gave a five, we'd have to explain wh why that difference was and why we had that opinion. Um, if we couldn't reach an agreement, um, we'd meet somewhere in the middle. Um, we thought that was quite a fair process, but what we did is we did that scoring blind. So we kind of wrote the, wrote the score down on a post-it and put it in the middle. 
um, so that we couldn't influence each other too much with the scores. Um, and that seemed to work well for us, and we kind of met a consensus, and it gave everybody that was on that kind of decision panel a, a, a chance to express their opinion of it, which was cool, because uh, it wasn't just my decision to make. I wanted my team to be involved in that decision as well, because they ultimately were the people that were going to be working with the agency. So I mentioned it got a bit mathsy, so um, we built um, a RFP calculator, which you can use yourself if you so wish. Um, just follow that link. Um, it's just a really easy way of being able to add up those scores. When you kind of combine the scores out of five with the weighting, and again, you can play around with this. Just um, if you want to go to that link, make a copy of it, it's yours, and um, you can play around with it. Um, just an easy way to, to add up those scores fairly so that you've got um, you know, a legit score of how people did on, on each of those criteria. And again, that helps with the feedback, which I'll, I'll get to as well. Okay, so um, point number six, um, being transparent about the actual process itself. So if an agency is going in to, to, to pitch for your work as a client and they don't know what's involved, they don't know who they're going to speak to, who the decision makers are, any of that key information, um, then you're not giving them the full picture to decide are they going to bid for, for it or not, um, is it worth their time. So it's another one of those factors which is um, really important to be upfront about, about that too. So um, some things to, to, to cover. So the stages of the process, um, you know, is it going to be a, a, a telephone kind of stage? Is it going to be a meeting? How many meetings do we need to come to? Is there a presentation involved? How many people are we presenting to? Um, that type of stuff is, is important to, to be really clear, and we, we covered that within our, within our RFP document to, to spell out exactly what those stages were, and I'll, I'll come on to that in a second to, to illustrate that. Um, the decision makers. So it's important to know who you're presenting to and what their, what their needs are. So the needs of a marketing director are going to be very different to the needs of a finance director. Um, you, if you're, if, as an agency, if you are talking about money, you might want to talk to the finance director rather than the marketing director. It just helps to, to, um, uh, to get the right information to the right people. Decision criteria and scoring. So obviously we just touched on that, but that's really important to, to, to show that um, how people are going to be scored so that you can get them to focus on the right things. And then the schedule. So how long is this whole thing going to take? Um, how long are we giving people to actually uh, make that response? Um, and this is kind of the schedule that, w that we stuck to when we went through an RFP process. So we said kind of we count day one as when we send the, the RFP out to the agencies that were on our shortlist. So we had a, a long list of, I think it was, uh, it was 10, that we sent our document to and said, would you like to pitch for our business? And then we kind of gave them three days to say, yes, we are going to, we are going to be involved or not. Um, after that, we kind of left it uh, seven to 10 days to arrange that kind of first interaction with them. And I'll, I'll cover in the next section how we kind of handled that as well. So that was about seven to 10 days. And then we actually gave a good amount of time for people to work with the document and give us really good answers. So we left it about two or three weeks for an actual deadline for the proposals to come back to us. And we were really clear about what time that we wanted them to be back during the day. And everybody did get it on time. If somebody had been one minute after, I would have been a hard ass and I wouldn't have let them go through. <laughs> um, and then we kind of we gave ourselves four days to be able to make that decision. So, um, you know, who were we going to select? We were very clear that we were going to have a finalist, um, or we were going to have a set of finalists, so we wanted to whittle that down. Um, and then we gave it another two weeks for the uh, agencies that have been shortlisted to present to us to actually prepare that presentation. What we also did at this stage was, if there were things that we were unsure about in the scoring, um, we asked them to explain it a little bit further. So we wanted the, the agencies to, to sell us this vision of what it would be like to work with them, but also any areas which we were unsure of from the first stage, we tried to cover that here as well, just to get a, a fuller picture and give them a better chance. Um, and then after the presentation, the final presentations, we gave them about another four days before we um, selected that partner, and, and about another four weeks before we actually started with them. If you can give longer before, before a start date, I would, um, but this is kind of what worked for us, um, just to get the, be able to get all the contract negotiations and all that jazz done. Um, but this is what happens when you, um, when you don't give people enough time to complete a, a document like that. They're just not, not going to give you the right information, and it can kind of get a little bit rushed, like if you're preparing for a search leads presentation in one week when you have plenty of time to do it. Okay, number seven, so the, the, 
The next point is dealing with questions fairly and effectively. So this for me was something that I was actually really dreading. I thought it was going to be a sense of a, like a really frustrating part of it. So it's trying to manage all the questions that you might get from multiple agencies, all probably going to ask you the same things. We decided that we needed to have another way. Um, one possible option would have been collating everybody's questions and then making sure the answers were shared out with everybody. That wasn't for me. Um, I, I really wouldn't do that. Simply because if you work in an agency, ideas are your currency. You know, that's the, the things that, that make you different. Why should another agency benefit from your clever question? Um, so I, we didn't choose to do that. Um, we didn't share any answers. And if somebody asked a really smart question, then they got the benefit of that information. Um, how we managed that was we restricted all of our communications to a discovery session. So we said to everybody that was involved in the RFP process, you cannot email us, ask us questions, call us up, arrange meetings, other than a one hour meeting or call where you can ask all the questions that you want. You've got a couple of weeks to prepare for it. We were restricted to this session. We won't answer anything outside of that, which we thought was a little bit ballsy. And it actually really worked for us because I was busy with my day job. My team were busy doing their own stuff. They didn't have time to manage all these, these interactions. So we restricted it to these sessions. Um, and it was really cool. Um, and it worked really well. Um, how we managed that was we used doodle.com. Um, so you can kind of set up the slots where you are available, time slots and such. And then we, um, the agencies that responded to the RFP, whoever kind of responded first, we said, you are agency one. Put your name as agency one in the doodle um, and, pick your, and pick your slot. Um, and another pro tip as well, if you are, if you are an agency um, and you get that choice of where, sh where should I pick, um, I would always go either first or last. Never be that agency in the middle because you sometimes get lost in the, um, in the jumble. Okay, and um, the last point is um, just the feedback after the process. So again, I, I spoke about that we wanted this process to be good for all sides. We wanted to make sure that everybody benefited from it. So it's only kind to be able to feedback um, to agencies why they did or didn't win. Um, we thought that was important to be a good human, give people feedback so that it can get better. Um, you need to be really kind of constructive with your feedback. Um, so we were able to use our scoring um, and show people where they went wrong. We were able to give detailed feedback on from our decision criteria and scoring where they didn't quite hit the mark. Um, and it allows agencies to get better. And all the agencies actually received that really well. And we're able to say, yeah, do you know what? This has informed our, our process for the future. Um, so that was, um, that was a cool thing to do. So those are the, the, the kind of the eight kind of things we identified as um, going for a successful process. I want to do a little bit of a bonus round. And that bonus round is just to talk about the agencies that did win, why did they win, and what do good agencies do to win, win business. Um, so this is something to look out for if you're a client. If you're an agency, these are the things that really connected with us and made us choose the agency that we did. Um, and it wasn't down to cost. Um, cost. The agency that we chose was the same price as everybody else, maybe even a bit more expensive. It was just about that connection that we made and how well that they scored in the, in the process. Um, so a good agency will make it about the client. Um, has anybody ever been on a date where the person on the other side of the table talks and talks and talks about themselves? They kind of ask you a question out of courtesy, but they're not really listening to the answer. I can see a few laughs and a few, yeah, OK, yeah, okay I'll leave that there. Um, but that's, that's kind of what pitching is. You know, you're trying to get another person to like you, and you're trying to get another person to, um, to interact with you. It's a two-way thing, so that it needs to be something that's mutually beneficial. I didn't want to go with an agency that just talked about themselves at length and talked about how good they were at solving problems that we didn't have. Um, it's just a, a waste of everyone's time. Um, and it's about people. Um, so one of the things that we asked within our process was, who are the people that are going to be working on our account? I don't want to just see the pitch team, because the pitch team are likely to disappear afterwards. Who are the people actually going to be delivering the work? What is their experience? What have they done before? What do they like to do? Um, so that was good for us. And I said, you know, we wanted to check the chemistry with our team. We wanted to make a human connection with these people. And um, also, from a, a safety point of view, it stops the, the old bait and switch, where some, they show you somebody really cool in the, uh, in the pitch process, and then you actually get somebody much more junior when it comes to delivering the work. Um, so that's, uh, again, something to, um, something to be aware of. Um, 
And then the last thing, um, good agencies really, really know their story. So they know what makes them different. They can talk about it. They know their elevator pitch. And I'm not talking about just um, the, 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 the trap that a lot of agencies fall into now is we have this tool which does machine learning and AI. Great. You, everybody has that. But how are you deploying it? Do you actually know what you're talking about? Um, the agencies that really kind of resonated with us, they knew what made them different. Um, they were able to sell on what their actual unique selling points are. Um, and they've got that story across to us really well because they were well rehearsed and they were slick. Um, and that can really make a difference. It, one of the things that I learned from, that, from the, the, the pitch doctor is even just that transition between presenters. Um, we, were, we were encouraged to, to um, practice those, those kind of handovers because it makes it look more slick, it makes it look more professional. And again, that really does make a difference with clients. Um, so those are, are good things to do. Um, so that's actually me. Um, so um, it's been great talking to you all. Please tweet me um, if you disagree with me or agree with me. Um, follow us and that stuff if you want to. Um, catch me in the bar because um, I'm going to have a pint. <laughs> Thank you. Matt Holmes, ladies and gentlemen. That's all right, Matt. Thanks. Cheers.